Well, before we start uh, the sermon this morning, um, we, we had some baptisms uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, and I, I thought it was great to be able to sh- keep on sharing their testimony, particularly for those who didn't um, make it uh, to that event. And so this morning, we're going to have a look at Emily's story. Hello, I'm Emily Lorenzo, the curly-headed, loud little boy's mum. <laughs> Um, thank you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I've always had some sort of faith in my life from a very young age. I was going to church with my nan and I used to have a lot to do with her church back then. But as I got older and I kind of drifted away from that and wasn't really something I kept in my life full time. I found myself every now and then praying to God, but it was only in a time of need and sadness especially after my dad passing when I was 17. I found I was a grudge-holding, judgmental, angry person, which drained me. When I found out I was pregnant with Lorenzo, I wore a cross and I didn't take it off my whole pregnancy. I felt like if I wore it, Lorenzo and I were always watched over. Since coming to church and playgroup, I have re-found my faith and I am a much peaceful and calmer person. Now that we are expecting our second child, we're excited to bring baby and Lorenzo up in such a loving place and feel like since refinding my faith, I'm ready to give myself wholeheartedly to Christ and get baptised. Well, today we're going to be talking about vision. How cool was that, by the way? That was really cool. We're going to be talking about vision because we've been looking at the past about what God's done in the past and now we're going to be looking at what we believe that God wants to do into the future. And, uh, and so we're going to be uh, working through a few things. But for the last two years, we've had a vision statement in this place and I'm not going to ask how many people know it, but it is inviting people, growing lives and shining Christ. That's been our vision statement, inviting people, growing lives shining Christ. We, we've wanted to be a place that welcomes and invites people into the kingdom of God and the community. We want to see people uh, grow in their understanding of who God is and what God has for them. That coming to faith doesn't just mean that you go to, go to heaven when you die, but that, that God has uh, a lot to do with growing us as people, that we can get rid of the junk that is in our trunk, that we can uh, enable God to heal us and restore us. And we've seen people, as we've been praying with each other, seen people released from the things that have bound them, the things that have hindered them, and it's been a great joy to see. And that once people have been invited in, once they're on a growing path, then we start to see them display the character of Christ. They, they shine it. They start looking beyond themselves and start caring about those around them and start working towards those things. It's been a, a joy to see that happen because we want people to be full disciples of Christ. We want people to mature into the things of God, to be able to hear God's voice, to be able to follow God's spirit and to do the crazy things that God chooses to use us to do. And if you followed God for any period of time, you would have come across the time when God asked you to do something just a little bit crazy, that just stretches you beyond where you're at, that that, that asks you to go beyond your natural limits, to care for people that you don't particularly want to care about to love people that you struggle to love, to help even though you might not have the means to step out in faith and help anyway. If you follow God for any period of time, then you'll have a passion for those who are yet to experience it. You want to see people who have experienced be free and grow in His love and His grace and you want to see them released into His very character to make a difference in this world. And and that's what we're wanting to do in this place, to be a place where people can come 
and experience God, to grow in their relationship with God and then to shine His character. And this should always be at the core of what we do and who we are. Everything should flow out of that. Our compassion for people should flow out of that source. Our desire to help people should flow out of that source of wanting to see people come, see people grow, and then shine their, uh, the light of Christ. I think that Jesus in the Lord Prayer summed it up when he, when he says, um, Our Father that art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. I don't think we spend enough time just thinking about that part of the prayer. Like it is in heaven, here on earth. Perfect communion with God, up in heaven, here on earth. Freedom, up in heaven, here on earth. That God has a desire to see us come in and experience his love and grace and become more like Jesus so that heaven can be here on earth. And so as I've been encouraging you down this track to the best of my abilities, God has pressed a story upon my heart which I think helps us put into picture uh, what he wants to do in us and through us into the future. And if you've been to a congregational meeting the last two times, you would have heard me share the story and it might be, you know, a bit familiar to you. If you're on staff here, you would hear it all the time. You're thinking, oh, Barry, you're not telling that story again. But it's a story that, that God has pressed upon my heart that I want to bring to you and unpack to you because I, I want you to, to grab it in and, and, and possibly even make it a part of the DNA of who we are as a church. The story is a very short story. It comes from the second uh, book of Kings in the Old Testament, chapter 4, 1 to 7. It's a story about Elijah who took over from Elijah, don't get them confused, one's grumpy and one's not, that's how I tell them apart. The one with the J is grumpy, the one with the S is mellow. Just if you want to know, if you're interested. And so this is a story of Elijah and during this time there was lots of persecution of the prophets, uh, a lot of uh, drought that was happening around this time and, and people... Um, are, are in need and, and we come to this story. A wife of a man of the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, so the good one, the, the happy one, the one with the S. Your servant, my husband, is dead and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditors are coming to take my two boys as his slaves. So obviously these are not grown men because they would have been able to pay back the debt. These were young boys uh, who were going to be sold into slavery. Not a great prospect. And so because her husband had died, she had no income stream. If, if the creditors came and take her boys away, she's got no future income stream. She's going to be destitute. And Elijah replied to her and said, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't just ask for a few. I like that. Don't ask for one or two. Go and get as many as you can. Then go inside, shut the door behind you, you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, 
put it to one side. There's a statement of faith. As each is filled, how the heck's that going to happen? That should be the question that you're asking. How's it going to happen, Barry? How's it going to happen? Let me tell you. She left him, shut the door behind him, her and her son, so she obeyed. They brought the jars to her and she kept on pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her sons, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your son can live on what is left. So not only did he did enough oil happen to cover the debt, but there was an overflow of oil that, that she could live on and could raise her sons on. Kind of gives you the same picture of the feeding of the 5,000 with Jesus, doesn't it? Where he says to his disciples, and there's a big crowd of about 5,000 men, not including the women and children, and, and, he go, and the disciples go, send them away. You know, they need to go get food. And he goes, you feed them. I love it when Jesus gets sassy. You feed them. They go, how do we do that? We don't have enough money. We don't have enough this. And he goes, what do you have? And he goes, oh, a, couple of fo- a couple of loaves and a couple of fish. And he gives thanks, he breaks it, and it feeds the whole multitude. It has echoes of that in it, doesn't it? Now, I'd like to say that I'm going to give you a brilliantly exegeted piece uh, of, uh, of this text. But I'm not really, because what I've done is I've sat with this text for about seven or eight months now. And what I'm going to give you is not uh, a a brilliantly executed text on this. It is the impressions that God has given me over that period of time. So if you go back and read it and you go, well, I'm not so sure, Barry, what you're doing. All I'm saying is that this is what God has been speaking to me about us as a church for the last seven or eight months. And he's used this story to highlight it. So let's go back to the beginning of the story. If we can put it up, thanks, Vinny. We have a woman. The woman is uh, someone who is in need. And God has been sharing with me that this wife of the prophet man is, is the church. Not just our church, but the church. That uh, the church at this point in time is in a destitute state in, in, in Australia, that it, is, that it is struggling. Us as a domination is shrinking rapidly. Other denominations are shrinking rapidly. And we can give all kinds of excuses about what that is. But the reality is, is that is what's happening. And what is happening is that our, because we, are, we are, have lost our focus or lost our husband or whatever way you want to say it, the potential is, is for our sons and daughters to be taken off into slavery, into the things of the world. And all of us have, have got friends who used to be a part of the faith that have been, are now trapped in things that we wish that they weren't trapped in. We've all got children and grandchildren that have been taken away from the things of faith and are trapped and taken into slavery and things that they shouldn't be. And our heart breaks for them and and we wonder what we can do for them. But I'll tell you what the woman did is that she didn't accept her fate. What she did is she went to the man of God and cried out, I need your help. There's a There's a sense in this passage that she's just expecting that Elijah is going to come and do something. And I think that if we ever want to be a church that does something, we've got to go to the God who does things. And we can whinge about the plight. We can be concerned about what's happening with the next generation. But all that will will do nothing unless we turn it into prayer. Until we come 
to the man of God, to Christ, to God, and cry out and keep crying out to say, God, only you can do something about this. So she cries out to Elijah, what are you going to do? And that's why as a church, I believe our future needs to be grounded in the crying out to God in prayer. That until we, we grapple with the fact that we need to keep on coming to God time and time again and go, God, you have got a different future for us than what we've presently been experiencing. We thank you for where we are, but we know that you have more. The woman's thankful for her two sons. She doesn't want to lose them, but she knows that there's got to be more. And I think as a church, we're going to come to the grave that we need to soak ourselves in crying out to God, to saying, God, there is a broken and a hurt world. There is the potential for for people to be taken into slavery, into bondage through drugs, through, through uh, immorality of one kind or another that just makes them lost, God, and, and, and we can't stand by any longer and just let it happen. And I think God's calling us as a church to be a church that does not stand by and let it happen, but one who cries out to God. So she cries out to God and he says, what do you have? And it's interesting in this story that she says, I just have a little jar of of oil. Now, now I'll geek you out for a little bit. The Hebrew in here for the little jar of oil actually means an anointing jar. An anointing jar is when when you want to pour it over someone for healing or God uses it time to bring his Holy Spirit upon someone in the Old Testament. They're the imageries. The jar is often used as an image of a person. Uh, Paul says that we all are jars of clay. And so we have this image of the spirit, of the healing, of the anointing. We have this image of the jar, a vessel, is, a, is, is people that God wants to fill. And so she only has a little And God says, I can do that with a little. And we may be thinking to ourselves, we we don't have a lot. We're pretty good. But we don't have a lot. And God says, I just want to encourage you to go around to all your neighbors and find jars that can be filled with my presence in my spirit. You are a jar filled with God's spirit. And what God wants us to do is go to our neighbours, knock on their door. So I'm from the Mormons. No, don't do that. And see if people are willing or not enough to enter into what God has for them. You know, the the boys could have gone around to all the neighbours. The neighbours didn't have to give them their jars. I'm sure they knocked on their doors and said, no, you can't have that one. That's full of people with onions. I really want that one. (laughs) The neighbours didn't have to give, but but what they collected is what the neighbours were prepared to give. And there are people out there that God is preparing that he wants to fill with his presence and his spirit, just like we saw with Emily at the beginning. Now, as a staff, we've been trying to put this into action. And uh, the <clears throat> about six weeks ago, we were praying about, God, who is someone that you want us to go and have a chat with to see if they're interested in being connected with God? And, and I felt God say to me, my neighbor. I couldn't even remember my neighbor's name. So, all right. And then I just didn't see him for four weeks. Like he just vanished off the face of the earth. And every time I'm driving in my driveway, I'm thinking, I want to see my neighbor. Where is he? He's just not there. He's normally out the front with his little dog, yapping away. Four weeks. And I'm thinking, God, give me another name. This is crazy. 
And I'm on week five, he's out the front. And I pull in, I hop out my car and go, right. Gotcha. And I walk up to the fence, go, how you doing? Because I can't remember his name. Shocking, the name. And we start having this conversation and I realise that he's been, he, he tells me he's been in hospital for the last three weeks. And he's had massive heart issues and lung issues and, and infections. And my heart broke for him. I said, man, would you be open for me praying for you? And he goes, I'd love you to do that. And this is a blokey bloke. This is a guy who worked on the motocross, you know, the... You know that thing where cars go around and around in circles? I don't understand it. He goes, you know what? I'd love you to. And so I walked across to him. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Jesus, I want you to work in this man's life. I want you to heal him of his problems and his issues. I want you to speak to him. And I followed him up a couple of weeks later and said, how are you going? Because he had an appointment the next week. I said, I'm going to catch up with you after the appointment. So I caught up with him after the appointment. I said, how did it go? He goes, the appointment got cancelled. I go, that's a bit of a bummer. I was really going to get excited about what God was going to do, but I'm going to have to wait. Now, I don't know what's, what God is doing in that man's life. I just know that God put him, in my, uh, him in my heart to go and, and offer him prayer. But what, I, what I, I am sensing that God wants us to do is to always have our hearts and our minds open to who the next jar is at our neighbor's place, at our workplace, at our school place that God might want to fill. This is not about you manipulating people or treating people. It's about saying, God, where are you at work and how can I step into it? Now, some of you might be freaked out by the concept of going up and praying for someone. But I tell you what, more times than not, when I offer to pray for people, even people I don't know, they say, I would love you to do that. And if we want to be genuinely be people who sees God pour His Spirit into other people's lives so that they can be invited, so they can grow and so they can shine then we've got to be the ones who go to our neighbours and find the jars that need finding. Now, if they're already filled with other stuff and the neighbours don't want to hand it over, that's fine, just leave it. But for those people who are going, you know what, I've been looking for something. I kind of believe in God, I've just put no boundaries on it, I don't understand it, but I'd love to. They're the people that God wants us to bring so we can pour out His Spirit into their lives. I always love to imagine myself in the text and I see this woman with a very long bench with, with probably about 20 or 30 jars. And I see her starting to pour the first one and her and her sons go, wow, this is, this is filling all the way up. Maybe we're making this up. So they go to the next one. And that starts filling all the way up. And you can see them looking at each other going, this is pretty cool. And then they go to the next one. And then they start having confidence that God's actually in this. And then they start filling the next one and they start getting a little bit excited. I reckon by the sixth one, I'll be yelling at my son, find more jars. And if he came back and he said, there's no more in the town, I'd say, go to the next town. Run. Find more jars. And that's what I believe that God is saying to us. As we've seen people come to faith and God fill them with his presence and his spirit saying, find more jars. Find people that I've prepared, people that I want to work in, people I want to fill and invite them in. 
and encourage them in. And here's the kicker. When there was no more jars, the oil stopped flowing. When they couldn't find another jar, when they stopped asking for jars, the oil stopped flowing. And I wonder, I wonder, that at times in churches' lives, we just stop asking for God to save people's lives. Whether we stop seeing the oil flow because we're not asking God to bring the next jar. That we stop seeing people come and be filled and be healed and be renewed because we stopped asking for it. Because we stopped going, we need another jar. God is not done. God has not finished filling up the jars that he wants to fill up. So I want to commend to you as a church that our, our vision into the future to invite people to grow lives, to shine cross, really comes down to whether we're going to be a church who is praying for God to fill jars, to change lives, to heal people and to renew. Because when we do, he's not just going to fill just enough that we need, he's going to fill more than we need. As we do, God's just not going to go, okay, I've allocated you 15 jars, it's done. He's going to keep on filling jars as long as there are jars to be filled to overflowing, to abundance. And I know we don't like that concept in the United Church. What we don't hear in this story is anything really about the woman other than she's a woman in need. We don't hear whether she's spiritual enough. We don't hear whether she's got Good enough morals. That was very bad English. We don't hear whether or not she's dedicated enough, whether she prays every morning or every evening. We hear nothing about that other than she is a woman who cries out. And I think it's deliberately so, so you can insert yourself as the woman in the story. Yes, even you guys, get over it. Because God has never been about using perfect people. He's always been about using available people. And so whatever excuse you're saying in your head about why God can't use you, why you can't pr simply, when someone shares a need with you, say, can I pray for you about that? And put a hand on their shoulder and say, Lord Jesus, work in this person's life. Whatever excuse you're using is not in the text. It's in your head. We don't hear anything about the woman other than she is a woman who cries out. I think that's all God wants are people who will cry out. And God responds to her plea. And I think that if we are a church who cry out for God to bring in the lost, to heal the sick, then God will respond. God has placed this story so heavily on my heart, I actually believe that if we take this seriously, God is going to bless this church in ways that we could never hope or imagine. And if we don't, our future will not be all that it could be. 
take a look at the empty seats next to you. And I want you to simply ask yourself this question, God, who do you want me to connect with? Who do you want me to pray with? Who do you want me to look out for? Who is the next jar that you want to fill? Think about it now. Take a moment. So we're going to pray for them. It might be a family member, it might be a neighbour, it might be a colleague, it might be a fellow student. But God has pressed upon your heart that they need Jesus. So we're going to pray for them. Will you please stand? And just uh, whether you really comfortable doing it or not, just stick your hands out in front of you. Just as a, a saying, here I am, Jesus, use me. And we're going to pray for that person on your heart and in your mind. Loving God, we thank you that you so lavishly want to pour out your spirit on all of your creation. That you want everyone to be saved, no one to be lost. And you, Lord, said the kingdom of God is like a shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one. So, Lord, I pray that you'll put on our hearts right now the one that you want us to find. Lord, we thank you that if you put it on our hearts, you're already at work in that person's lives. So, Lord, will you give us an opportunity to ask how they're going and to pray for them. Lord, if they have a need to be bold and say, can I pray for you about that? Will you give us an opportunity, Lord, to find the jars that you have in this world and to see your spirit pour out upon their lives? Lord, take us on an adventure of faith. Use us for your kingdom glory. Help us, Lord, to invite people to grow lives and to shine Christ. In Jesus' name we pray.